John chapter 4, uh, we'll read together the uh, first 45 verses of this chapter. Let's hear the word of the Lord. John 4, beginning in verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus Himself did not baptize but only His disciples, He left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And He had to pass through Samaria. So He came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes... He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. And just then His disciples came back. They marveled that He was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, 
one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's go before him in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to gather in your house on your day with your people around your word to worship your Son. We pray that you would send forth your Spirit, teach us from the word, instruct our hearts, give us uh, understanding, attentiveness, give to us light from your word, and help us, Lord. Enable us by your Holy Spirit to walk according to the truths that we learn in your house that we would be brought into closer conformity to the character and nature of our Lord Jesus Christ that we see on the pages of his word. We pray that you would uh, remove all sin, all sinful inclinations from us, O Lord. Forgive us. We pray that you'd help us to walk uprightly before you. Grant to us the righteousness of Christ, O Lord. We have nothing good in ourselves. We need you for all things. We pray in your name. Amen. Last week, we considered more verses together than we had up to that point. Sermon went longer than I expected. I thank you for your attendance and your, your patience. I didn't really want to break off the narrative before verse 26. So we'll be picking up in, verses, in verse 27 and consider through verse 42, Lord willing. Uh, So we know that Jesus was on his way to Galilee, but he had to stop in Samaria. The shepherd had to call his sheep, beginning with this woman who came to the well. Uh, So he sends his disciples away, and he talks with this woman, something no self-respecting Jew would have done to converse with a Samaritan woman. Uh, rabbis were not known to communicate with women uh, on, on an individual basis. And Jesus uh, patiently and graciously draws her to himself. Uh, the woman in her, her ignorance, thinking G- Jacob is greater than her, thinking that the living water is something natural. And Jesus graciously deals with this woman, opens her eyes to see that he is Messiah. And on his way to Galilee, Jesus uh, sees more than just this one woman come to himself. He draws a whole town to himself. And we have a, a citywide revival in the text before us. Uh, he has left Judea because controversy and debate are not his main goals, not because he's afraid of the Pharisees, not because he's trying to distance himself from all controversy. We know he cleansed the temple, but he is going to go on to Galilee and uh, stops in Samaria for this, this brief period. He was sent to the sheep of the house of Israel, the lost sheep, and these Samaritans were half breeds. They were not true Israelites. Um, in the sense that they did not have pure Jewish lineage or heritage. They had only one Jewish parent. The Samaritans were those who were left behind in the capital of Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. And Babylonians intermarried with them, and they polluted, as it were, the the pure Jewish bloodline. And so the, the Jews who had... Uh, pure Jewish blood, they despised the Samaritans, they could not stand them, and 
thought they were unclean and would have nothing to do with them, would not even share the same utensils. So for Jesus to ask of this drink is showing that Jesus does not uh, go along with the, uh, the pharisaical uh, rituals and cultural appropriation of the day. He is here to save sinners. He is here to reach uh, the lost with His gospel. He is here to call all whom the Father has given to Him, to Himself. Uh, he not only stops in a Samaritan town, he intends to eat Samaritan food, drink from this Samaritan dish. He's come to save religious Jewish sinners in that he converses with Nicodemus concerning the way of salvation, according to what Nicodemus needs to hear. And he comes to save heathen Samaritan sinners, telling this woman what she needs to hear. And come to save a whole town full of Samaritans. I think it's interesting in the text that for 700 years, Samaria has been inhabited by pagans who syncretized the Pentateuch with the idol worship of the Babylonians. Remember, the northern kingdom fell in 722, and we're now in approximately A.D. 30. So for 750 years, this place, Samaria, this region has been in darkness. And even before it fell, remember, the northern kingdom did not have a single righteous king. The southern kingdom of Judah had a couple, several, more than just a couple, several righteous kings. The northern kingdom did not have a single one. For 200 years prior to being carried off into exile, they had one corrupt king after corrupt king after corrupt king. You talk about a cue. Like Pastor Little mentioned this morning, those kings were constantly plotting to destroy one another, wiping out bloodlines, burning down palaces, committing treason, and, and all of these things. And so they went one after another after another. And many times you could barely get one to reign a year or two before somebody else was supplanting him. And it was just complete chaos and wreck and ruin. And so Samaria is a dark place, a very dark place. All 19 kings they had were wicked. Not a single king to lead them to the Lord. And yet here comes the Lord to Samaria, the true light, who came into the world and His own did not receive Him. But this land of Samaria, a town in this dark region of Samaria, been under darkness for almost a thousand years, this town comes to know the Lord Jesus. How can this be? Well, as Pastor Lewis said often before, God likes to stack the odds against Himself to show how sovereign and mighty He is. He lets darkness build up in Samaria so that when the true light shines and dispels it, we see how glorious the light truly is in dispelling nearly a thousand years of darkness. The true light has dawned. How did God revive this city that had spent most of its life shrouded in darkness? Well, I'd like us to consider the the means that He used. Yes, we have the Lord Jesus before us, the preeminent example. And while there's some things we cannot imitate about the Lord Jesus, I believe there are some means that that Jesus used an example that we can follow as we seek revival in our times. And sometimes we pray that the Lord would just return and and set everything right. Certainly our hearts cry out for that. As after the manner of the psalmist, Lord, when are you going to come right all the wrongs? And our hearts groan in much the same way. Other times we pray for revival to come down from heaven. Lord, please come and save the lost. I think there are six things in the text before us that we can see that the Lord used to bring about this citywide revival. And for those of us, I hope we all desire revival in our day, I think we can learn from these these six uh, lessons, at least six, that are in the text before us. And this is not to say that, that revival comes about mechanically. I have no use for 20th century evangelical efforts 
who believe that if we can just whip people up in a frenzy and follow these, these things that, that the Lord somehow is obligated to grant us revival. And some of these preachers that go about on these revival circuits and they have a preacher come in and, and do revival preaching, um, much of that is merely an effort to twist the arm of God because they want to see revival and they want God, they, they feel like they're forcing God, He must come if we follow these things. I'm not suggesting any of that in the points I'm about to outline. God can get, grant revival when He wants, how He wants, to the extent that He wants, and God is sovereign in all things, and we must acknowledge that. That if revival is going to come, it must come from God. We don't have the power to revive ourselves, much less anybody else, apart from God working in us. But I want us to consider the, the climax of our previous text, I believe, was verse 26, when Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, I who speak to you am he. And he reveals for the first time in our narrative in John that he is the Messiah from his own lips. Others have confessed him to be the Messiah. John the Baptist, Peter and Andrew, um, Nathaniel and Philip and those, all of them have come to see that He is the Messiah. But here Jesus in the first person says that He is the Messiah. And it's not to a Jew, it's to a heathen Samaritan. I believe the climax in our text before us now, and I'm not just looking for a climax, all of Scripture is glorious. I'm just thinking what the text builds up to. I believe is the confession of the Samaritan populace of the city in verse 42 we know that this is the savior of the world the exclusive savior of the world he's not come for just Jews he's not one of many saviors he's the sole exclusive savior and he has come to save sinners the world over how do we get from a town that has been in a region under 700 years of pagan syncretism, preceded by 200 years of heathen kings who refused to obey the law of God to a citywide revival. Well, I'd like us to consider these points. I'll go ahead and give them to you, and then we'll, cons- we'll look at them in the text. Verse 27, Jesus is talking with a woman. And I believe that the confession, this is the Savior of the world, happens because Jesus broke with societal norms while tired and thirsty. He did what society in its natural state would not do. And secondly, in verses 28 through 30, that the confession is given because the woman herself came to see the light, and she went and did personal evangelism. Immediately left her water pot, the express purpose for coming to the well, for the express purpose of going to the city and telling others that she had just met with Messiah. And then verses 31 through 34, the confession of this is the Savior of the world happened because it was the sustenance of Jesus' life to obey God. And in verse 35, the the confession, this is the Savior of the world, happened. Why? Because the fields were ready for harvest. And someone went to reap. And then verses 36 through 38, the confession that this is the Savior of the world happened because others had labored before and prepared the way. And then others come build on that work. And then sixth and finally, The confession of verse 42, we know that this is the Savior of the world happened. Why? Because those people had a personal encounter with the Word, the living Word. So let's turn our attention to the text itself. John 4 verse 27, just then His disciples came back. Before this verse, the the two main players, if you will, in the the narrative have been Jesus and the Samaritan woman. There's no one else. There's God, the Creator, and His creature He's about to redeem. And Jesus is, of course, God omniscient. He knows all things. 
He knew exactly how long the conversation would go and, how, and it would, that it would last just long enough before the disciples returned. And he said all that he needed to say to this woman before his disciples returned. They did not move too fast or too slow. Jesus said all he needed to say. Knows, he knows what's in every person. We considered that in John 2.25. And he said everything that this woman needed to hear. And thankfully, those who were not thinking according to the Spirit in this text, which would be the disciples, they kept quiet. <laughs> they talk, uh, no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? They kept quiet. They were not minding spiritual things. They, their eyes were perceiving that Jesus, this is Jesus, a Jew, talking with a Samaritan woman. What, what's going on here? Not thinking according to the Spirit. It's always a blessing when those not thinking according to the Spirit keep quiet. That's why, ministers, we pray that if we come in this pulpit, that we speak only that which that the Spirit of the Lord would uh, bless for His people. But Jesus has power to grant life to whomsoever He will. It's His divine prerogative. He has the power to do that. And He knows what's in the heart of every person. Not a one of us possess either of these abilities when we do evangelism. Certainly not. But I believe we can apply this lesson from Jesus' rendezvous with this woman of Samaria. And this is lesson one, point one. Spreading the gospel is more important than any societal or cultural difference. Remember, we, we outlined the contrasts between Jesus and this Samaritan woman. Besides the fact that He is the Creator and she is the creature, He is pure and sinless, she is filthy and wicked, He is, ethnically speaking, a Jew, she is a Samaritan. He is a man, she's a woman. So on at least two counts, two accounts, Jesus should not even be talking to this woman if Judaism has had, had its say. But Jesus breaks with uh, societal norms for the sake of the gospel. And if we would see revival, we must be willing to break with societal and cultural norms where they serve only to be a hindrance to the furtherance of the gospel. Those, all the, all, anything that is a hindrance to the spread of the gospel, that is a line that you must cross in the name of the Lord Jesus for His sake. Because cultural differences are insignificant. They are irrelevant when it comes to the spread of the gospel. The gospel is relevant. The gospel must be spread. Cultural appropriation does not have to be upheld. Societal differences have no, uh, no benefit, no relevance over the gospel. None whatsoever. And so all of those lines must be crossed. All of those barriers must be uh, overcome. And just as the woman made a big deal about her being a Samaritan, Jesus' disciples make a big deal that Jesus is having a conversation with a woman. It says in the text, they marvel that He was talking with a woman. What is this? Oh, the disciples, slow to learn as we are, that Jesus has come to redeem the whole world. God so loved the world. That includes Samaria, definitely a part of the world. Slow to believe they were. What is a marvel is that the what is a marvel is not that Jesus talks with a woman, but the fact that the self-sufficient and thrice holy God wants to talk to his needy, sinful creatures at all. That's what a marvel is. So a Jewish rabbi talks with a woman. Big deal. What is amazing is that this is the creator, the pure, holy creator, talking with his sinful creature taking the initiative to talk to his creature. Jesus, but you notice, Jesus did not talk down to her as a Samaritan, made no reference to her being a Samaritan. She made a big deal about that. Jesus didn't. The disciples make a big deal about the fact she's a woman. Jesus doesn't. Not an issue to him. She's one of his elect. He's going to redeem her. Jesus has come to save souls, of course female souls, of course Samaritan souls, male souls, Gentile souls. Jesus has come to save sinners. And that does not come with any ethnical 
or cultural qualifications. Sinners. And our business while we are here on this earth is to win souls for Christ. That is the one thing we're here on earth to do because it's the one thing we can't do once we reach glory. We're here to do the ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors of God prior to entering glory. Once we are ushered into eternity, that business is over. So that is the business that we must concern ourselves with for as long as we inhabit time, as long as we inhabit space on this earth, as long as we have time on this earth. If we were to make the best use of the small window of time to win souls to an eternity with Christ, we must be willing to cross any and every cultural and ethnical border to win souls. It's not easy, I grant that. It's often intimidating. But my brothers and sisters, I remind you, we must fear God above man. Remember that it is our God who has told us to evangelize and make disciples of the nations. We're not told, leave these people alone because they're not part of my plan. The disciples were told, yes, start with the lost house or the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Start with them. And then work out. And we see that in the book of Acts. That they did. And we have a revival in Samaria in the book of Acts. The world, they do not want to hear the gospel. We grant that. We know that better than they do. They don't want to hear the gospel. They may not want to hear it. You may not want to share it with them in a, in a moment of weakness. But King Jesus has commanded His church to evangelize and make disciples of the nation. And His authority trumps both your wishes and their wishes. They are bound to obey the gospel and you are bound to give it to them. And not to make excuses. And what keeps you from witnessing to others. I know there are plenty of things that, that keep me from witnessing to others, that, that distract me, that, that serve as a barrier that I'm happy to use as an excuse all too often. God forgive me. There's all kinds of things that, that we think, well, I, I'm not going to reach this person on this basis. Um, it can be anything. Silly little things keep us. I know they keep me sometimes from witnessing to people. Well, they have a mask on. It's going to be hard to talk to them. Well, if they wear a mask, they're afraid. They think the air is poisonous, some of them. They need to know about, uh, if they're afraid of dying, they definitely need to know the Lord. Maybe the fact that it's not that they don't have a mask, maybe it's the fact that they're smoking. Well, I don't want to have to go talk to them. The air stinks over there. That's, uh, that's a silly excuse, but that's exactly what it is. It's an excuse. Maybe it's the way that they talk. I don't have to listen to all those four-letter words over and over again. No. For the sake of the gospel, maybe we need to. It's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean. You can hear that stuff without being defiled. It's what comes out of a man. It's when you start repeating it, we've got a problem. But for the sake of the gospel, maybe you need to go hear a little bit of it. Maybe you need to warn them. When somebody, one of the things I've started doing is when people say, uh, they use the phrase, oh my God, in a flippant way, I will uh, come at them and say, well, what are you praying for? And I'll go, I wasn't praying. I go, well, then don't take the name on your lips. Maybe we need to hear some things we don't want to hear for the sake of the gospel. Maybe it's what they eat. This person's too weird, they have such a weird diet. They're so consumed with their diet, they're not going to care about the Lord Jesus. Just silly little things we make up. Maybe the vinaigrette on their salad doesn't smell so good. That would be a big one for me. But we need to go be willing to witness to people. Maybe it's what they drive. They drive this big monster truck, this big bruiser of a man. I could never reach them with the gospel. Well, maybe that man's tr- idol is his truck and he needs to know that that's not something, that's not a fit object for worship. They need to be reached with the gospel. Maybe it's a sticker on what they drive. 
go, this person's just completely off the rails. Maybe it is their political affiliation. Well, they're too far gone because they're aligned with this political uh, party or this political ideology. They need to be reached with the gospel if they're not thinking the thoughts of God. Maybe a big one is just the way that they look. You can look at somebody and go, nah, I don't want nothing to do with him. We make that decision real fast. Real fast. Maybe it's the way they look. Maybe it's their hairstyle. It looks like a package of gummies. Maybe we don't want to reach out to them. Maybe it's their clothing or maybe it's their, the lack thereof. We don't want to go talk to them. Well, maybe their ideology, maybe what they worship, what their idol is, is what they see in the mirror. And again, that's not a fit object of worship either. They need the gospel. Maybe it's the fact they're covered with tattoos. I don't want to be talking with these people. We're covered up with a bunch of ink under their skin. They need the, go- need the gospel. <coughs> Maybe it's that they have cuts and scars all over their body. That's definitely someone that needs the gospel. They're willing to stab at the image of God in themselves. My goodness, what would they do if they could actually get a hold of God? That's definitely someone that needs the gospel. Far from being a deterrent to sharing the gospel, these things often reflect just how broken people are and just how much they need the gospel. These things should not be a deterrent. They should be an impetus to share the gospel. I can assure you of this. If every Christian assumes someone else will share the gospel with that person, we have no reason to expect to see revival. If we just write people off and say, well, somebody else is going to have to reach them, you cannot expect to see revival. If every Christian takes that approach and we just gather together on Sunday and maybe a few on Wednesday and we don't ever take what we learn inside this place and bring it to people that need it every bit as much as you do, we cannot expect to see revival. That would be on par with a foolish farmer who was praying for rain and expecting a crop when he hadn't planted a single seed. Why would he expect anything at all? If you're not sowing seed, don't pray for rain. Don't pray for revival. This this was very convicting to me as I studied this. How many times I'm praying for rain and I haven't put my hand to the plow. I haven't planted any seed. Yet I'll, I'll, I'll spend effort begging and pleading with the Lord for revival. Maybe I need to distribute some of that effort into actually sowing seed that there may be a revival. The Lord has given me means to use. Yes, the, the divine prerogative is His, but He's given us means. And that's my part to obey Him. I leave the results up to Him. The crop's going to be whatever it is. That's His part. My part is to obey. We are not above telling Others And to think that, that you are above telling someone else is pride. And it, it, at the core, it's a forgetfulness of just how wretched I am apart from God doing the work in me. People say, but for the grace of God, there go I. And yet too often we have, or I have, the disposition of the Pharisee standing over here praying, Lord, I thank you I'm not like them. I don't have tattoos. I'm not worshiping a truck or my image in the mirror. I'm not eating this weird thing. I don't have this, I'm not aligning myself with this weird ideology. And yet, but for the grace of God, not there go I, worse go I. How much further off would I be than even they are? That's the only thing that keeps me from being leaps and bounds more wicked than anyone else. The grace of God. Because I know if I was left to myself, that'd be a race I'd win. The most wicked sinner that was ever on the earth. So we must be willing to cross cultural lines, to do things that make us uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel. The discomfort will last but a moment, my brothers and sisters. But but we have eternity to gain. And they have eternity to gain. So I encourage you, cross the lines that need to be crossed. In one, one practical, I don't, I don't have many because I'm not very good at this. And so you can pray for me, the Lord will help me in this. I, I'm, I'm not as extroverted as I come across. I, I know. It. But one way that I have seen benefit in this is giving 
homeless people rides. I know homeless people can be scary. You don't know if they got guns, knives. Well, if you train yourselves with them, you're ready to match them when it comes to a, a show of arms. But my point is, when you pick up someone and get them in your vehicle, you have a captive audience. And if you can turn the radio off and get off of sports and the weather and things that are really trivial, that's a great time to, show, to share the gospel with people, especially if they're asking for more than a five-minute ride. But even five minutes is sufficient. Sharing the gospel with, with people, building the cross lines to, 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 to hang out with people who don't look like us and don't talk like us. This woman wasn't like Jesus, and yet he did not consider it defiling to intermingle with her. And he was spotless. None of us are. The disciples marveled, but no one said to him, what do you seek? Why are you talking with her? Thank, thank goodness they kept it to themselves. Thank God they kept it to themselves. Verse 28, the woman left her water jar and went away into town. And said to the people, come see a man that told me all I ever did. She leaves her water pot. Maybe she left her water pot so Jesus and his newly returned disciples can get themselves a drink. You know, Jesus is still thirsty. He's man. He needs water. She did not leave her water jar because of what the disciples um, said. They didn't say anything to shame her. It's not that she's running away from them because you know, they've made her feel ashamed. That's not, I don't think that's the reason. She left her water jar, I believe, because spiritual water and not natural water is now of primary importance to her. That's the reason I believe she left the jar. She's got business now. This woman at this point has been regenerated. And she's got business for the Lord now as all daughters of the king and sons of the king do. And she ran to tell others about the time she went to the well to get natural water and came away with spiritual water. She's got a message. And now she's a messenger. And so the second point is that revival happens when those who hear the gospel and believe begin to tell others about Jesus. They don't keep the gospel to themselves. It's not a message you're meant to keep to yourself. We, don't, we will not have any revival to get excited about if we just keep it all to ourselves. There's no, no new converts can be brought in when there's not a presentation of the gospel that saves. The gospel is a gift that we may give away to others any number of times and, and, with, and lose none of it ourselves. I would say that perhaps the more you give it away, the more valuable it becomes. That the better you know it, the more you talk about it. And the more excited you get to share it as you see the fruits of your labors, as souls do come to see the Lord in His saving grace in Jesus Christ. So she leaves her water jar, goes into the town, and what does she say when she gets there? Verse 29, Come, see a man that told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Those who know the saving love of Jesus cannot help but tell others that they might know it too. This, If, you, if the, the love of God in Christ is precious to you, you will talk about it. You will talk about whatever is most precious to you. Some people it's their grandkids. Some people it is their truck. Some people it's what they've collected in their life. What it's what they own. It's their, their job. They'll talk about what's precious to them. Is it the love of Jesus Christ? That is what you will talk about if that is what is most precious to you. She is grateful that Jesus took the time to share the truth of God's Word with her privately. So she drops everything to go tell others publicly. That's how much it meant to her, what the Lord had done 
in her life. If you are grateful that someone took the time to share the truth of God's word with you, you will share it with others that they might share in the joy of salvation. And the only reason you, my, my brothers and sisters, have come to believe in Jesus Christ and have come to believe in the gospel is because someone shared it with you. Whether it was hearing it in a sermon, whether it was your parents, children, teaching it to you, whether it was someone who at work shared it with you, or just in the streets doing business, someone had to share the gospel with you. Put a Bible in your hand. I'll give you a track to read. You heard maybe a broadcast. Somehow, some way, whether orally or on the printed text, it made its way to you. If it wasn't for someone else disseminating the gospel, it would have never reached you, is my point. So we need to pray for those who are disseminating the gospel and, and seek to enter into that labor. And be converts that tell others about the Lord. In a small town, which, which Sychar is, every, in a small town, everybody is either famous or notorious. Comes with living in a small town. This woman was clearly the latter due to her many adulteries and fornication. She's had five husbands. That's at least five families in this town that know about her. Maybe they were in neighboring towns. But this woman's reputation is, mm, she was, when she came to the well at noon, probably was alone. Probably came at high noon to avoid going with other women who might you know, shun her, give her a cold shoulder, look down their noses at her. But this same woman has just been transformed by the love of Christ. And she is about to bring the most famous invitation that this town has ever heard or ever received. It's been given to this woman. Why? Because Jesus saves sinners. He saves whoever He wants. Before she met with Jesus, this woman was bold to sin. Five husbands? She was bold to sin. After she's met with Jesus, she's bold in love and in the grace of Jesus. She's going to go tell others about the Lord. She's not seeking another uh, sexual um, interlude. She's seeking to bring the gospel to her neighbors. Whereas before she met Jesus, she did not like to talk about her sins, even though they were well known. Now she doesn't mind saying, this man told me all I ever did. Before, she didn't like acknowledging she was a sinner. But once you've been saved, you don't mind at all acknowledging you're a sinner. It doesn't mean you have to say everything you ever did that God saved you from. But you don't have a problem acknowledging you're a sinner. Huh. You can say, I'm a sinner, sure. But the grace of God is greater than all my sin. I'm happy to acknowledge I'm a sinner. That qualifies me for this, the free grace of God in Jesus Christ. The Christian faith is the only faith where one can speak of how terrible their sins are without being morbidly depressed. Well, I'm just such a great sinner. Oh soul, if that is you, look to the great Savior. He has saved countless multitudes of sinners far worse than yourself. How long will you be bogged down with, oh, my sins are so great? Well, turn and look to Christ. Robert Murray McShane had a pretty good ratio. I think you could up it a little bit. He said, for every one look at self, take ten looks at Christ. Do twenty. Do a hundred. As much as your sin bogs you down, look to Christ. Why would you fixate your gaze so much on yourself? Look to Christ. The Christian faith is the only faith where we can speak of our sin without just being depressed all the time. Why? Because those sins are forgiven. Cast in the bottom of the sea. Lost. The Christian faith is also the only faith where one can boast of having a perfectly clean conscience. Because I didn't merit it. I was given it. It's a gift of the free grace of God. And we can boast in it because to boast in it is to make much of Christ. Because it was He that secured a clean conscience for you. It wasn't anything you did. It wasn't your penance. It wasn't your good works. It wasn't even your evangelistic efforts that gave you a clean conscience with God. It wasn't meditation. It wasn't memorization. It was Jesus Christ and His atoning death. And the benefits that flow from that to all who believe. We can boast in this because it's to make much of Christ. Precisely why you were created. 
to make much of Christ, which is precisely what this woman does. She's happy to go now. She's got a clean conscience. Her sins are not weighing on her anymore. If they would, she wouldn't be running into town to see everyone before she would have hid from people. Why, she's coming to the well at noon all by herself. But now she's running back to the town with a message. A Christian can boast of what Christ has done for him because it's not anything what he's done. He's boasting of what Christ has done. He's boasting of the greatness of God in overcoming his sin. It's to confess, I could not overcome my sin. I could not fix myself. I could not cleanse myself. I could not atone for my sin. But Christ could. That's our boast. That's her boast. Going into this town of Sychar. And she does not make a wild claim. Oh, I found Messiah, guys. She invites them. Come see. Can this be the Christ? Oh, she already knows it is. But she invites him to come see. She came back and said, Oh, yeah, I found the Messiah. What do you know about Messiah? All you do is practice adultery. What do you know about Messiah? But she invites him. He told me all I ever did. They're going, what? This woman used to be ashamed of all that she ever did. Now she's saying, this man knows it all and I'm glad for that? Huh? And so her testimony compels him. Can this be the Christ? Verse 30, they, they investigate that claim. They went out of the town and were coming to him. We, we mentioned last time it was about a half mile from the well in the field to the town of Sychar. So this, they're making this half mile walk to get to the Lord Jesus. The hope and excitement of this woman warrants a citywide investigation. Why the Messiah who was supposed to come to Israel is intermingling with these unclean Samaritans? What is going on at this well? Do people say that about you? What's going on in their life? Something's different. There's a force at work there. The Holy Spirit. Verse 31, the, John turns his attention back to the disciples. <laughs> Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Mm -hmm. Rabbi, eat. The disciples should take a cue from the Samaritan woman and know when to mind natural things and when to mind spiritual things. She has gone through this conversation with Jesus consistently bringing up natural water. She's stuck on natural water and can't get to spiritual. Of course, without a work of the Spirit of God. But once she gets it, she's on the subject of spiritual water. Well, the disciples here are stuck in this thinking about na uh, food, thinking according to the flesh. The whole town the disciples just returned from is now coming up behind them. to hear, see Jesus and to hear His own testimony concerning Himself. And they're saying, Rabbi, eat. Rabbi, eat. And Jesus responds to them, again, graciously. Graciously condescends to them. It says, My food is to do the will of Him who sent Me and to accomplish His work. To accomplish His work. To the Samaritan woman, Jesus likened water to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. To the disciples, He likens food to doing the ministry of reconciliation with sinners. That is the sustenance of our life. It's the sustenance of Jesus' life. It's what He lives for, lives to do. To magnify God in the gospel. And that is what you were created to do. So if you're not doing that, you're missing the purpose, the point of your existence. And like the Samaritan woman for the first few instances, she, the disciples miss the analogy. They say to one another in verse 33, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus responds, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. Now He defines what that food is. It's to, do the will, it's to do the will of Him who sent me. I must be about my Father's business. 
the first creed of his life. I must be about my father's business. Jesus does not mock his young disciples for their ignorance, but graciously explains to them the nature of this food, this sustenance of his life. His sustenance comes from obeying God. We, uh, for nearly 20 years of my life, we, we had uh, two West Highland White Terriers. And um, dinosaurs probably went extinct trying to fight West Highland White Terriers. Those were about the fiercest beasts that ever roamed the face of the earth. Extremely fierce, extremely loyal. All 20 pounds of them. 20 pounds of ferocity. And those dogs lived to eat. They, they lived to eat, fight, and sleep. It's what they wanted to do. The Christian does not live to eat. The Christian eats to live. We get enough food to sustain us to keep doing the work of the ministry. We don't see food, or we ought not to see food, as an end unto itself, as an idol, but as a means to gain energy so we may do the will of God. That's the only purpose of food. That and to give us pleasure that we might know the goodness of God. Steak is delicious. Ice cream is delicious. Pork chops are delicious. Apple pie is delicious. And when I taste those things, I try to make it as often as possible. I am reminded of the goodness of God. But we eat to be nourished for the work of the ministry. Don't eat as an end unto itself. That's gluttony. Oh, that we would know the purpose of why we're here as Jesus did and have our eyes fixed on the glory that is to come, on the harvest. Our third point, revival happens when the Christian evangelizing has a life that testifies to the credibility of the gospel they proclaim. Revival happens when the Christian evangelizing has a life that testifies to the credibility of the gospel they proclaim. By What do I mean? By not giving primary importance to physical things, such as eating, drinking, and resting, all things that Jesus needed at this point. But by not giving them the primary place of importance, Jesus shows this woman and his disciples and maybe the townspeople too that the gospel is of utmost importance. Now is the time to harvest. There will be time to eat, sleep, and drink later. Now is the time for harvest. Now is the time for harvest. Obeying God is of utmost importance. Importance. Yes, God has created our bodies to have physical needs. Yes, we must attend to them and be responsible with the temples that He's given. Yes. But there are times when those things, such as food and drink and rest, all things we all enjoy and need, need to be set aside for the sake of a harvest. And just like cultural barriers, those are sometimes barriers that need to be crossed for the sake of the gospel. If we would see revival, we must show the world that our faith affects more than just a couple of hours on Sunday morning, but that our whole lives are given over to God and making His gospel known. Why we eat and drink and sleep, it's to make the gospel known. The world is not compelled to believe a gospel that you don't seem to need very much yourself. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. Verse 35. Jesus goes on with an illustration. He's in verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white 
for harvest. And again, Jesus uses a natural illustration to explain spiritual truth. An agrarian society such as Israel would naturally know when to plant, when to harvest. Some, there's different views on what the four months are. Maybe Jesus was saying it's in four months from now there will be a harvest. Some say that, well, in, in, in Palestine, there, there's only four months between the time of the planting and the time of the reaping. Either way, when you take that, Jesus' point is still made. There has been almost no time between sowing the seed in the life of this Samaritan woman and now we're about to reap a huge harvest because of the seed that Jesus sowed in this woman. In the same day, she came to know the Lord and a city will come to know the Lord. Jesus is saying to His disciples, can you not see? The fields are white for harvest. Here comes the whole city after Me. Why are you talking about lunch? Here comes a whole city to converse with Me, to talk to Me, the Lord of glory. Why why are you worried about what's on the menu? Do you not see? There are things of more importance here. These are Samaritans are coming to me. Jesus came into the world and his own did not receive him. He came to his own. They did not receive him. Here are people who are not Jesus' own, the Samaritans, and they are coming to him. Oh. That should have been the response of the Jews to run to their Messiah. They didn't want anything to do with him. When they got the chance, they nailed him to a tree. And yet here come these pagan Samaritans, half-breeds, been trapped in the darkness of pagan syncretism for 700 years. They are now coming to see the Messiah. He's not going to them. They're coming to Him. The Lord is working, and the disciples are talking about lunch. There'll be plenty of time for lunch. The Lord's at work here. The reaping has immediately followed the sowing. Most of the time, the Christian must go to the world to bring bring the gospel. It is very rare to have the world come to the Christian to hear the gospel. But such is the case that this whole town is now coming to Jesus Christ to investigate his claim or her claim that he is the Messiah. The fourth point, revival happens... When our focus is not primarily on the natural harvest, but on the spiritual harvest that is before us. We're not caught up, eat, drink, and be merry, but we're caught up in serving the Lord and being about our Father's business. Yes, it's true we have an abundance of blessings to be thankful for. We pray before the meal precisely for this reason. We're one of the wealthiest societies in world history. We have freedoms that give us great opportunity to promote the gospel far and wide. Let us not be fixated so much on physical blessings such as food and drink that we waste our freedoms to share the spiritual blessings in the gospel. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. We had a whole conference on that thing. I hope you're still praying as a result of that conference for laborers to be sent out. Jesus says, verse 36, Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Why should we be focused on the harvest before us? Well, certainly for the sake of the glory of God. These are His creatures made in His image for His glory, and that's the one thing they won't do is give glory to Him. And that ought to concern us if we are a born-again child of God. If God is our great love, we will be most sensitive to the hatred of the world for Him. When something you love or a person you love is mocked and despised and ridiculed by someone, do you not feel that? No, they ought not to be speaking of them this way. That's not how I feel about them. 
How much more, infinitely more, ought that to be the case with the the thrice holy God? If we feel that way about uh, sinners whom we have relationships with. Here Christ offers another reason. As if the glory of God and our duty before Him was not enough. Here Christ offers another reason. The one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. God rewards us for doing that which is merely our duty. Jesus has done all the work of bringing this woman to himself. And now she, on her testimony, is bringing the whole town to see him. And the disciples are going to get to take part in this ministry, not just, not just in this occurrence, but in future occurrences. They're going to take part in the ministry where they simply do all they're bound to do. Jesus does all the hard work of actually saving the sinner, of actually converting him, of actually making that which was ruined righteous. The hard part is God's part, and He does that. We merely get to be under-shepherds, co-laborers in His fields. We are, as Luke 17 said, after we've done all we can do, which is more than most of us do, certainly more than I do, but even after we've done all that we can do, we are still unprofitable servants on our best day. And yet God rewards, gives wages and fruit for eternal life. Jesus is pleased to use us in His sowing and reaping. Not only is He pleased to use us, pleased to reward us for doing that which is merely our duty to do. Whatever our Creator says, that's our duty to do. He doesn't have to incentivize us with rewards. He doesn't have to have rewards programs for obeying Him. He's the Creator, we're the creature. That settles it. And yet because God wants us to know just how good He is, He gives rewards. <laughs> he gives Just because He's good and He can do it just for His own glory, just to show how gracious He is. We're bound to serve Him if He didn't give us anything. Yet He gives us more than anything we've ever earned or deserved or merited. Boundlessly more. He rewards us for the small labor we do, even though He didn't need it, and He did all the hard stuff. Who wouldn't want to work under that kind of boss or manager or supervisor? Well, tragically, countless multitudes that would rather starve than come, as old 271 says. And they'd rather starve than work for such a one. They'd rather waste themselves away than labor for such a one. They may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. Verse 37. One sows and another reaps. Men have seen this throughout the ages. They watch other men reap what they've sown. They they spend their lives building their estates, building their fortunes, building their empires. And then they have to leave it all behind. We brought nothing into this world And it is for certain we will carry nothing out. And we have to leave it all behind. Everything that we do. Ministers have to leave their sheep behind. We have to leave churches behind. Works that we've begun in the name of the Lord. They have to be left behind for future generations. But in Christ's economy, the sower and the reaper rejoice together. The one who sows gets to see the work of the Lord. The reaper gets to see and share the joy with the sower. We saw it in Amos 9 that our brother David read for us. Verse 13. This is a fulfillment of that prophecy, what we're looking at in John 4. Amos 9 verse 13. Behold, the days are coming. And in the days of John 4 is their arrival. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. And the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. There's going to be this mutual joy. Mutual joy. One sows and another reaps. Here is where it is preeminently displayed. Not in just leaving things behind for another. 
One sows and other reaps, but there's both. There's joy there. In verse 38, Jesus says, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. And when you begin to evangelize, you will find there are other Christians laboring too. You may feel alone at the beginning. But once you get out there and reach out to sinners, you will find that other Christians have reached out to those sinners too. That we are, none of us are lone rangers in this. That's why we are uh, an ecclesia, an assembly. Not a monogamy. Not an autonomy. We are an assembly. There are other Christians laboring too in the vineyard, in the field of God. God has never left Himself without a witness, even when Elijah, or Elisha, I can't remember which one, said, Lord, I'm the only one left. And he said, nope, it was, it was Elijah. The, nope, I got 7,000 over here, Elijah, and I'm just as faithful to them as I am to you, so get back to work. God has His Paul that plants, His Apollos that waters. God gives the increase. Our fifth point, revival happens when we build on the work of others that have labored before us and prepared the way. Realize, Christian, the church has existed for 2,000 years, doing the same things, gathering publicly to worship the Lord, singing His praises, reading His Word, preaching His Word. The saints have been equipped for ministry for 2,000 years, and they will continue to be so as long as the Lord decides to tarry His return. And you are called to build on what has been built already, that others may build on what you have laid behind you. David laid up a great store of wealth with which to build the temple. If you look at 1 Chronicles 22, 1 Chronicles 22, David laid up a great store of wealth. 1 Chronicles 22, verse 11, David is charging Solomon. We already know from Pastor Little going through the life of David. Nathan said, David, you're not going to build this temple. Your son Solomon will. It will be built in a time of peace. You're a man of war. So David charges his son Solomon. Verse 11, we're jumping in the middle of the charge. He says, Now my son, the Lord be with you, so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God, as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding that when He gives you charge over Israel, you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and the rules that the Lord commanded Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Fear not, do not be dismayed. Lifetime of comfort in those words. Verse 14, with great pains... Says David, I have provided for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold. Talent being 75 pounds. A million talents of silver. And bronze and iron beyond weighing. For there is so much of it. Timber and stone too I have provided. I haul scrap metal. Uh, not because I'm you know, desperate for money. I do it for fun. I, I enjoy recycling. I enjoy that part of Christian ecology. I like hauling scrap metal. Pastor Little knows he can call me and I'll make a fridge, a dryer, a grill, whatever disappear. I enjoy hauling. A million talents of silver, bronze and iron beyond weighing. What a fortune. There is so much of it, says David. Timber and stone too. All the elements are there for the construction of this temple. And what does he say? What does he say? I, these, these five words. To these you must add. Well, how do you add to something beyond weighing? We've already lost track of how much we've got. And I'm still expected to add. Solomon must add 
to this immeasurable store of wealth. And we may think as Christians in the 21st century that there has been enough work done. There's been enough books published, been enough sermons preached, enough studies done in the Word of God. There's enough. We've lost count of how much of it that there is. But in our day and age, we must add. We can't just go, well, you know, Spurgeon preached on all this and Calvin wrote on all this, and that's enough. We don't have any more right to sit around than Solomon did. We must add and build in our day and age if we would see revival. Build on what has come before. It's not that we supplant and replace and say, well, you know, because Spurgeon said it, I couldn't say it any better. Spurgeon's not alive. He can't go share the gospel to your neighbor. You may give him a tract that Spurgeon wrote, but it's your job in 2023 now to share the gospel with your neighbors. Don't rest on what's been stored up. Use it. Avail yourself of it. In the service of the Lord. Keep building. Keep sowing. And don't think, I'm ever going to get to a plateau. Well, whew, I've done enough for the Lord. We could live a million lifetimes and be devoted to God every moment of every day. And it would not be a, a, a drop in the bucket for what the Lord has done for us in forgiving our sins. We must keep building, keep sowing if we will see any harvest in our day. Revival is not just going to spring up out of the past. We have means to use as all the brothers and sisters have used in the past that saw revival in their day. We have the same means. We preach the Word of God. We witness to our neighbors. We live a life that's in accordance with the Gospel. And we keep doing it. To these, you must add. Is your life an adding to those things? Or are you simply resting on what's already been gathered? The Samaritans had a Jewish heritage of sorts. That wasn't stirring up any revival for them. Well, you know, at least we're halfway Jewish. That's not helping them. They had the Pentateuch. They didn't follow it. But once the true light dawned and was able to apply the truths of the Word of God to them. Oh. And Christians in America cannot look to the past for the hope of her future. Well, we started out well. We started out at least acknowledging God in our founding documents. Revival is not going to come from that. We must preach the Word of God. We must witness with our neighbors. We must make disciples of our neighbors. We can't just go, well, if people would just wake up and realize how well we started, we might be, we might be better off. They need the gospel. We need what the Samaritans needed. We need the living word to apply the written word in our day. Which brings us to our sixth and final point. Revival happened. This revival happened. Revival happens. This is true of every revival. Because people had a personal encounter with the word. The word of God. The son of God, Jesus Christ. There's no revival that he's not at the center of. There's no revival unless he's being declared. There's no revival where he is absent. People need an encounter with the Word of God. The people believed her enough to come to Jesus. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. They believed. They believed enough to come. And whether their faith was of the kind in 2.23, many believed in his name when they saw the signs of it that he was doing. They definitely came to believe because of his word. Many more believed, verse 41, because of his word. There was true revival here. It wasn't just a lip service acknowledgement that Jesus was something special. They truly believed unto salvation. Because when Jesus grants faith, it's true faith. The people believe that her enough to come to Jesus. Do you have a testimony that leads others to come to Jesus? Or do they just go, wow, look at the change that person's made. It's not me that changed myself. It's the Lord working in me. And if He doesn't work in me, then I'm just going to revert back to my old sinful ways. So Lord, do not leave me or forsake me. Verse 40, when the Samaritans came to Him, they asked Him to stay with them. 
They asked him to stay with them. A, a man that told this sinful woman all she ever did? Are you afraid to stay with someone like that? You might know all about me. Yikes. No, they asked him to stay with them. They've got an appetite for grace. They want to know more of the Lord, more of His saving grace. And he stayed there two days. And you know he was eating off some Samaritan utensils then. Jesus fellowshiped with these Samaritans. Like John and Andrew, how thrilling it must have been to hear Jesus speak over the course of those two days. Nothing could be better than to have Jesus reveal himself to you in word or deed. That is precisely why we gather here every Sunday, is it not? To know more of Jesus, to learn more of him from his word. Oh, to contemplate him in all his goodness as the word is preached and made effectual in our souls. Is that not precisely why we gather here? Four squares, great, and y'all cook well. But I'm here to worship God, and I'm here to learn more about Jesus. And I want to know Him, and I want you to tell me about Him. And I want to contemplate Him as I'm in His house. I want to pray to Him. We're here to know more of Jesus, to have Him revealed to us. And Jesus revealed Himself to these Samaritans in both word and deed. I believe this is precisely what makes heaven so heavenly. It's just Jesus revealing more and more of His goodness to us. If he's infinitely good, then eternity cannot exhaust that. And so heaven is just going to be us contemplating the goodness of God. It won't be anything about us except the glory of God and how he worked in us. It's all about Jesus, all about his power, his glory, his goodness. The closest thing we have to heaven is Sunday. I I love worshiping with y'all every Sunday. I can't wait to keep it going on the other side of Jordan. And we're going to just do more of it. Gather around the Lord. I'm going to be shutting up on that day. And I know you'll be glad for it. It's okay. We're going to be listening to the Lord and soaking it all in. Now I won't have anything to say on that day. I'll be listening to. Verse 41. Many more believed because of His Word. Short verse. What glory. We saw one Samaritan woman come to know the Lord, and now many more believed. Does that thrill your soul? That sinners come to believe in the Lord? Too often times I get the mind, ah, to hell with them. Tired of them. This should thrill our hearts that many more came to believe in Him. And all it took for the Samaritans to believe was for Jesus to speak of himself. Yes, other things preceded it, but this is the climax. They had a personal encounter with the Word. In every revival, that's always a characteristic of it. They had a personal encounter with the Word. And they said to the woman in verse 42, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We've heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And every soul that is saved must have faith in Jesus and not faith in the testimony of another. Whether it be some miraculous testimony, well, I was just a drug addict, or a porn addict, or I was a murderer, I was in the the mafia or a gang, and I came to know the Lord. Praise God! But when you hear these miraculous testimonies, don't put a drop of faith in them. Well, you know, I, I, I want to believe in God because I see how He's changed that person. You know, and then their testimony becomes the basis of your faith. That's not a saving faith. That may implore you to go seek the Lord that has done a work in them. That's exactly what it should do. But don't rest it in just what they say. Don't let your faith rest in the testimony of a friend or a parent. Oh, please, no, that will not save you. Their faith was not in what the woman said, but in what the Lord had said concerning himself. We know that this is the Savior of the world. One time I was conversing with a young man who professed to be a Christian and We got to talking about apologetics. So I asked him something about how he would defend his faith to an atheist or something along the lines. And he responded, well, you know, Albert Einstein was a brilliant man who believed there was evidence of God in creation. I said, so is your faith in God or Albert Einstein? Albert Einstein may be a brilliant man, but he gets stuff wrong just like everybody else. Don't take his word for it. Have faith in God. And these Samaritans did not have faith in this woman's testimony, as miraculous as it was. 
Our faith is not in miraculous testimonies. It's in the God that's behind every miraculous testimony. That's where our faith ought to lie. In the God that's, that works in sinners. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Hearing by the word that is Christ in this case. You must believe the testimony of Scripture concerning Jesus Christ if you are to be saved. Another person's testimony, apologetics, logic, reason, all these things can be useful in persuading a sinner to believe, but none of them are grounds for faith. The sole object of your faith must be Jesus Christ. Whatever else you've heard, it must be Jesus Christ as He has revealed Himself in Holy Scripture. Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Savior. There's not others. And He's for the world, not just the Jews. There's a, an exclusive and there's a universal. He's the exclusive Savior for the whole world. People may not like that. Well, other religious people, are, they're, they're so sincere and they're so um, devoted to their religion. Surely God has to honor that. No, He doesn't. He honors his son. Are you in his son or not? Are you part of the world he saved or the world he's part of the world he's going to condemn? We heard about the condemnation this morning from Revelation 14. So yes, while we acknowledge that God is sovereign, revival happens in his time according to his will. We can never manufacture it, fabricate it, force God to bring it, none of those things. If it is to come, God must bring it. And when God does bring it, it will come. Nothing can stop it. But God has given us means to use, and I believe we see a few of them here in the text. So may God make us faithful laborers in His field. Revival happens when spreading the gospel is more important than any societal or cultural difference. Revival happens when a convert begins to tell others about Jesus. Revival happens when the one evangelizing has a life that testifies to the credibility of the gospel they proclaim. They're not a hypocrite. Jesus is their all in all. Revival happens when the focus is not primarily on the natural harvest, caught up in the things of this world, but the focus is on the spiritual harvest that is before us. Fifthly, revival happens when we build on the work of others that have labored before us and prepared the way. We are not content to rest, but to these you must add. Must add. And then sixth, revival happens when people have a personal encounter with the Word. So bring them the Word, my brothers and my sisters. We will close with a hymn together.